All right, so we want to talk about the theory of the wind-driven circulation. And I'm going to start off by doing a very idealized problem to kind of be illustrative. And it will be the case of a, an infinite ocean, which is extend to infinity in the east and northward and southward directions, east-west direction. So it's an infinite plane and it's infinitely deep. So it's a vast ocean. It's a constant. We're going to neglect any variations of density. So it's a semi-infinite volume of water of constant density that's at rest. And then at t equals zero, we uh, turn on suddenly the surface stress so that the surface fluid accelerates instantaneously to a speed u. And then after that, the surface is moving at speed uh, u, capital U, in the eastward direction. And what we want to see is what happens to the fluid below. So how does that momentum uh, at the surface, how does that propagate into the interior of the ocean? And we're going to do this ignoring the effects of rotation. And we do this so that we can then contrast the case for Ekman layers where rotations are very important, which is uh, the case for the real ocean. All right, so the, the domain is an infinite domain. So this is uh, northward y, this is eastward x, and we're going to neglect the sphericity of the Earth. It's an infinite Cartesian plane. And this is z upwards. And this goes off to minus infinity. This goes off to plus infinity goes off to plus infinity, off to minus infinity, and then down here, it goes off to minus infinity also. G gravity is pointing down this way. And because the fluid is uh, assumed infinite in the x and y direction, any patch of ocean uh, at one particular value of x is going to be identical to a patch with a greater x or another x, right? If we move around, there's nothing, there's no origin to the problem, so there's nothing to distinguish any particular patch uh, or column of fluid if we move it to north, south, or east, west. And so the velocity field will not be dependent on um, x and y. It will depend it only on z. So if we set up the, the problem, we have uh, at uh, v, the vector v uh, is equal to 0 for t less than 0. So from minus infinity up to t0, the fluid's at rest. At t equals 0, then, and onwards, we have uh, the x component, so x hat dotted with v, which is equal to u, that of t, and z equals 0 is equal to some constant capital U, which we prescribe. So this is the surface boundary condition. Surface, surface. Maybe I should say equal. So this would be the initial condition. Initial condition up to and equal to time t0. For t greater than 0 and onwards, uh, this is for t greater than 0. And this is the surface condition. Surface, surface boundary condition, condition. Now there's going to be another boundary condition, the one that at the surface of the ocean, the vertical component of the velocity has to vanish, right? If W wasn't zero, then the, the surface of the ocean would be rising up through the atmosphere. And so that is not the correct boundary condition. So W is equal to zero at uh, Z equals zero, which is also the surface boundary condition. This one here is called a kinematic boundary condition, whereas this one is a dynamic one. If the fact that we prescribe the speed equal to U we're in essence, in essence, imposing a stress on the surface of the ocean. And so we're, there's going to be a flux of momentum uh, from the atmosphere into the ocean. So this would be analogous to imposing a stress at the surface. And then uh, since the ocean at T0 is, the ocean is assumed to go to minus infinity at depth, we're going to have a far field condition that V is equal to zero uh, as Z goes to minus infinity. So this we call the far field field. All right, um, hopefully you're getting the picture in your head. A little bit more about the stress. So if this is uh, z, and this is the surface, and x, and then we impose the wind stress, tau uh, x wind, right? And the stress in the ocean side, the viscous stress, is tau x ocean 
is minus mu du dz, right? We're assuming that the viscous stress is going to be a flux of momentum down gradient. So going from a region where the speed is fast to a region where the speed is uh, slower. So if I take, if I was to take a little uh, box of fluid over here, of thickness delta z, then uh, there would be the stress, the flux of momentum into the box would be this. And then there would be also a flux of momentum from the wind into the box. And that flux, those fluxes have to uh, sum to zero in the limit where delta z goes to zero, right? As delta z goes to zero, then the mass of that little thin layer of fluid goes to zero. And if there was a finite flux of momentum, that would imply uh, infinite accelerations, right? And so the, the speed would be going infinitely fast. So that's can be maintained. So the boundary condition is that uh, tau x ocean plus tau uh, x wind has to be zero. In other words, the surface wind stress on the ocean so minus mu du dz plus tau x from the wind equals zero or the boundary condition becomes tau x wind is equal to mu du dz. So we could have uh, imposed this boundary condition and solve for what u is in terms of the wind stress. But we're instead we're just going to do the case where to make it uh, everything simpler, we're just going to prescribe the speed at the surface. Okay, so now let's um, write down what the continuity equation. So first of all, the continuity equation is du dx plus dw dz. I guess there's a dv dy. Oh, I guess I should just say that first. Since the fluid is the same in all directions. And we are putting the stress in the um, in the x direction. There will be uh, no velocity in the y direction, right? There's no Coriolis force in this problem, and so if we're pushing the fluid in that direction, then there's nothing to accelerate the fluid in the northward direction. So v is going to be assumed zero everywhere. And so now the, um, the continuity equation div the v equals zero. That's the same thing in Cartesian as du dx plus dv dy plus dw dz equals zero. This one we assumed is zero. V is assumed zero everywhere. And then we also assume that the fluid is the same in the x direction. So this is zero. And what we're left with is dw dz equals zero. And dw dz equals zero means that w is a constant. And I've already told you that W is zero at the surface, otherwise there'd be a flow, otherwise the sea surface would be rising up through the atmosphere or going down if W was negative. And so if W is zero, oh, sorry, if W is zero at the surface and it's constant, then it has to be zero everywhere in the fluid. So from this, from the continuity, we can deduce that W is equal to zero everywhere. Right, the, the sea surface can't go up because there's a finite amount of water, right? If the sea surface was rising everywhere, then we would be creating more and more fluid, which is um, not consistent with the, the diverse. There's a finite amount of volume in the ocean. All right, that was a mathematical way of saying something obvious. Okay, so we know that W is zero, V is zero, and we know that U is independent of X. U and, yeah, U is independent of X. So let's write down um, the two components of momentum that are left, the X component and the vertical component. Right, everything, V is zero and it's independent of Y. So the X component of momentum is rho du dt plus u du dx plus V du, well, there's no V, so that's zero. And there's no du dx, right? Well, let me write it down and I'll, I'll save it. V du dy plus W du dz, that's the, the material uh, derivative, the acceleration following the fluid is equal to minus dp dx plus mu d2 u dz squared. And there would also be, I guess, a plus mu d2 u dy squared and a plus mu d2 u dx squared. All right, so let's get rid of some of these terms. We assume that everything is the same for all y's. Right? There's nothing 
distinguishing any particular y value. So this term vanishes, this one vanishes, because it doesn't depend on y. u is independent of x also, it's the same in all x directions, so this vanishes. Uh, du dx, again, u doesn't depend on x, so this term vanishes. v is 0, this term vanishes, and we've deduced already that w is 0, so this term vanishes. All right, that's great. So now our problem is simplified to the following. I'll rewrite the exponential equation after we put in all these symmetry arguments. Minus dp dx plus u d2 u dz squared. That's the exponential. What about the z component? Z. Well, w is 0, so the um, dw dt is going to vanish, and we're left with 0 is equal to minus dp dz plus rho g, or minus rho g, gravity is pointing downwards, minus rho g, uh, and w is 0, so this is, there's no viscous stress, there's no w. And this equation we can integrate, so from this one we know that uh, dp dz is equal to minus rho g, or p is equal to minus rho g z plus a constant but we have to be careful here it's a constant with respect to z but it can be a function of x and t right it can be a function of x and t plus some function i'll call it p primed now that uh pressure of x we are going to um All right, let me try this again, take two. So um, the x momentum equation is rho du dx, no, it's rho du dt is equal to minus dp dx minus plus mu d2 u dz squared. And the uh, z momentum equation is zero is equal to minus dp dz minus rho g. All right, and we can integrate this equation and what we will get is p of x, z, and t. Remember, we assume the problem is invariant in y is equal to minus rho g z plus some integration constant, constant. But that constant, of course, can be a function of x and t in principle. However, if we look at the x momentum equation, we've assumed that du dt is independent of x, and therefore, well, we assume that u is independent of x, and therefore, both terms here are independent of x. So dp dx has to be a constant with respect to x. And if we assume the pressure is the same at plus infinity and minus infinity, then that constant has to be zero. And so therefore, the pressure drops out of the x momentum problem, the x momentum equation. So what we're left with in the end is simply this equation for the x momentum equation is equal to mu d2 u z squared and we had a problem that doesn't depend on the pressure so the all right so this is the equation this is valid for uh for um z less than zero less than or equal to zero and for t uh, for all t i guess but for t greater than zero in particular greater than or equal to zero and I know that the boundary conditions are u is equal to big U at z equals 0, uh, u is equal to 0 at t equal to 0, and u goes to 0 as z goes to minus infinity. So this is the surface boundary condition, surface, surface boundary condition. This is the initial condition, initial condition. And this one is the far field condition, far field condition. And so we want to solve this equation. If I divide through by rho, rho is assumed a constant, then this becomes um, mu over rho. And the mu over rho, we call that the kinematic viscosity and we just define it as nu. So nu is equal to nu over rho. And so this just becomes nu. 
All right, so this is the problem we want to solve. So we have a partial differential equation. It's a, it has derivatives of time and it has derivatives of respect to z. And so we want to find a solution to this problem. All right, so so far we've reduced our problem to the following one. It is rho du dt is equal to mu v2 u dz squared subject to the boundary condition u is equal to big U at z equals 0, uh, u is equal to 0 at t equal to 0, and u goes to 0 as z goes to minus infinity. Okay, uh, we can divide through by rho, and this will become mu over rho, which is the kinematic viscosity, so nu is defined to be mu over rho is the kinematic viscosity. And so we can replace this by mu. All right, so if we look at the problem, so this is the problem we want to solve. It's a partial differential equation, partial with respect to t and respect to z, and it has boundary conditions. So what we're looking for uh, is a function u. So we're trying to find u which is going to be a function of time, right? So we're trying to find out what's this unknown function, phi. It's to be a function of time, a function of z, right? t and z appear in the problem. But there's also some parameters. It's going to be a function of mu. And it should also be a function of big U, right? We change big U, we should change the solution of U. Um, but one thing that's interesting is that the big U appears only here in this boundary condition. And if we rescale U, little u, by big U, then we can make this boundary condition just be the new variable equal to one, right? So if I introduce, so we left U tilde to be the original U divided by big U, which means that U, the original U, is big U times U tilde. And now if I go in the problem and wherever I see U, I replace it by big U times U tilde. So if I put a tilde here, I multiply by big U, I put a tilde here and I multiply by big U. Here I put a tilde and multiply by big U. Tilde, big U, tilde, big U, right? Now the U's have gone and I have U tildes everywhere. And what's nice is that the U's here appear on both sides, so they cancel. This cancels. On this side, the U's cancel, right? And this just becomes one. And these U's cancel. And so the problem becomes, right? This is gone, and this is gone, they canceled. This is gone, and this just becomes one. And these ones are gone, right? Divide both sides and I still have zero and zero. So I get back the same problem, except now where I used to have the big U, I just have one. Which means that now if I have the same reasoning, the, pro the solution to this problem is uh, U tilde, right? Has to be equal to some function, some unknown function, of t, z, and nu. It cannot be a function of big U because big U doesn't appear in the problem. So that means that the original U over the big U is a function of t, z, and u only. But more than that, since u over big U is dimensionless, right? It's a velocity divided by velocity or speed divided by speed. There's no dimensions, which means that this phi, this function phi, cannot be any old function of tz and nu because uh, any old function might be dimensional. But we know from this side that this is a dimensionless quantity, so phi has to be a combination of t, a function of a combination of tz and nu that is dimensionless. So what we want to do is we want to introduce a new variable that's going to be a combination of these, which is dimensionless. So how do we do that? Well, we know that uh, the dimensions of z is just a length. The dimensions of t is time. And the dimensions of nu, the kinematic viscosity, is going to be a length squared time to the minus 1. And you can check by looking at the dimension of this quantity that it's a diffusivity, so it's length squared for time. And so if I introduce a new variable, eta, um, it will have to be uh, some combination of t, or let me put in a 
sort of z to the alpha, some power alpha, which I don't know, but some power, z to some power, t to beta, some unknown beta, nu to gamma, right? And I want it to be in such a way that if I take the dimensions of eta, then that will be equal to the dimensions of z raised to the power of alpha, the dimensions of t raised to the power of beta, and the dimensions of nu raised to the power of gamma. But the dimensions of z is a length, so that would be l to the alpha. The dimensions of t is a time, t to the beta, and nu, which is in length squared for time, will be uh, l to the two gamma, t to the minus gamma. And now, if I want this to be dimensionless, I know that alpha plus two gamma has to be zero, right? Alpha plus two gamma, oops, two gamma has to be zero. Otherwise, we're gonna be left with some dimensions of length, right? And we know that, um, we've already decided that we want to find a variable that's dimensionless. And now for the time, we know that beta minus gamma also has to be zero. So we have two equations, two linear equations in three unknowns, alpha, beta, and gamma, three unknowns, two equations. It's gonna be an infinite number of solutions. Uh, so we can introduce an arbitrary parameter, let's say for alpha. So we're gonna solve everything in terms of alpha. So gamma, I'm gonna solve everything in terms of alpha. So gamma is equal to minus alpha over two and beta, which is equal to gamma, is also minus alpha over two. And so my dimensionless variable is going to be equal to uh, z times t, where's t? Uh, t to the beta, sorry, times t to the uh, minus a half and nu to the minus a half. And then I also have uh, an arbitrary factor of alpha, right? Um, so I know that the function phi, right, has to be a function of eta alone, right? It's really, it looks like a function of two variables, t and z, but in reality, if it's gonna be dimensionless, it actually has to be a function of eta. And so I could pick alpha to be one, for example, and just, if I wanted to pick a different alpha, then I could just change the function phi. The, the upshot is that it has to be, the variable eta has to depend on z times t to the minus a half times nu to the minus a half. So for convenience, I'm gonna pick this following uh, variable of eta. So I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna define, let uh, eta to be equal to z over the square root of uh, t times nu. Right, that's, that's this quantity, z over the square root of t square root of nu, right? And then the alpha, I could vary it into the phi. So that means that the solution, if it's gonna be dimensionless, has to be the following. So my function u over u is gonna be some unknown function of eta. Oh, actually, I wanna introduce a factor of two out here. Right, two doesn't change the dimension, so it's okay. I could have, that just slightly redefines what um, phi is, how it's related to eta, or what f is. And I just introduced it for convenience later on. It's gonna make the algebra a little bit neater. All right, so uh, the solution u is equal to big U times f of eta, where eta is equal to z over two times the square root of nu times t. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, take the partial derivative of little u with respect to t and partial derivative of u respect to z twice and then substitute in that equation. Um, let's go back to the original one without these tilde. So to keep the physics all nice. So remember, I introduced the tildes, the big u's canceled, the original problem without the tildes and this was found the definition of u. And plug in here. So du dt, is equal to big U times F prime, right? D F D eta. I gotta write it this way. D F D eta times D eta D T, right? 
And dA to dt, what's that? So dA to dt is equal to um, z over 2 root nu times minus 1 half t to the minus 3 halves. Right? I took the partial derivative of this quantity with respect to t. And that's the same thing as z over 2 root nu times uh, minus over 4. I combine the minus half outside. Then I'm left with 1 over t to the half times t. Right? That would be t to the 3 halves. And the reason I wrote it like this is this is the same thing as minus z over 4 square root of nu times t times 1 over t. And this is the original uh, eta variable, right? So it's equal to minus 1 half uh, eta to over t. Plus 1 half u d, df d eta times uh, eta times t to the minus 1. Yes. And now let's do, all right, du dz is u df d eta times d eta dz is equal to uh, u df d eta and d eta dz is 1 over 2 square root of nu t. And then the second derivative, so then d2 u dz squared, right? I'm computing these to substitute back in the equation, is u d 2 f d eta times uh, d eta dz times uh, 1 over 2 square root of nu t. And d eta dz is uh, just 1 over square root of 1 over 2 square root of nu t. So I get u d 2 f d eta squared, second derivative f, times uh, 1 over 4 nu t. And now I'm going to substitute this and this into the equation to find out, to get a new equation for f. And what's beautiful is that f here, these are not partial derivatives, right? These are just regular derivatives with respect to eta. So we're going to turn what was a partial differential equation into an ordinary differential equation. So if I substitute in, what do I get? I get um, on the right hand side, on the left hand side, I mean, I get minus one half u f primed, that's the f derivative, times eta times uh, t to the minus one is equal to, and on the right hand side, I get nu times u, the u, times f double primed. I have to erase all this mess here. f double prime times 1 over 4 nu t. And I guess this t here I'll just put on the bottom. The t's cancel, let the t's go away. So what am I left with? And the u can, the big u cancels. So what I'm left with is minus 1 half f prime times eta is equal to the news cancel also, the news cancel, the t's cancel, um, and the u's cancel. f double prime over 4. So if I bring the 4 on this side, I'm just left with minus 2. All right, so this is a, a differential equation, second order. It's not a constant coefficient, depends on eta. But it is in the form that's separable, right? So this means, this equation is this side first, df prime d eta is equal to minus 2f prime times eta. And then separating variables, I have df prime over f prime is equal to minus 2 eta 
the eta. Integrating both sides, I get the logarithm of f primed is equal to minus eta squared plus a constant. And if I exponentiate both sides, I get f primed is equal to exponential of minus eta squared times a constant up front, h, like that. Like the kind of exponential constant that becomes a multiplicative constant. All right, so that's the first derivative, uh, the first integration. Now I still have f prime, which is the derivative, so I need to integrate a second time. Oops. So integrating again, what I find is that f is equal to uh, the integral from 0 to eta of uh, a exponential e to the minus eta primed squared e eta primed. If I integrate from 0 to plus some constant. And this is, okay, so this is after we've integrated twice. Remember, this is f of eta is this functional form. It has two integration constants, a and b. And to determine those, we have to use the boundary conditions. So the first one, uh, that u is equal to zero, no, u is equal to big U at z equal to zero, implies that u, which is u times f of eta, right? And if z is zero, then eta is zero, right? Remember, eta is equal to z over two mu t. So if z is zero, eta is zero. So big U, f of zero is equal to big U. And the big U's go away, and this is f of zero equal to one. And then the boundary condition at um, t is zero. That means U is equal to zero at t equal to zero. If t is zero, eta is infinity, so that means that f of infinity has to vanish. And the last one, uh, u goes to zero as z goes to infinity. Well, if z goes to infinity, eta goes to infinity, so that means f of infinity has to be zero again. So these two, um, they're the same. So that's good. We have only two conditions and we have only two integration constants. All right, so uh, if f of zero is equal to one, then if I plug in eta equal to zero, then I have the integral from zero to zero, which is gonna vanish, which means that f of zero is equal to b, and therefore b is equal to one. So this implies b is equal to one. Um, and then the other condition, f of infinity is equal to zero, means that uh, means that uh, this integral from zero to infinity times a e to the minus eta squared d eta plus one is equal to zero. All right, so this is the condition on a. Uh, this integral here from zero to infinity of e to the minus eta squared d eta. Uh, students who've taken ESS 212 will recognize it as being very closely related to a Gaussian integral, right? We remember that um, the normal distribution, from, if I integrate the normal distribution from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over the square root of 2 pi times uh, sigma, the exponential of minus uh, eta squared over 2 sigma squared um, d eta, is equal to one, right? That's the, the Gaussian is a PDF, so it's normalized to one. And that means that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus eta squared over two sigma squared, d eta, is equal to the square root of two pi times sigma. And I wanna pick sigma so that uh, this becomes one, right, in the denominator here. So if I pick sigma to be one over root two, then the twos will go away. So if I put sigma equals to one over root two, one over root two, then this two times sigma squared will just become one. 
which is good. And now it's starting to look like this integral, except that this one goes from zero to infinity, whereas this one goes from minus infinity to infinity. Um, this uh, Gaussian integral is symmetric about eta equal to zero. So if I change the Dover limit from minus infinity to zero, if I go to zero to infinity, I'll just get half as much as I used to have before. So I change this to zero, and then I get half, one over two. And so what I have is uh, the root twos cancel, I have root pi divided by two. And so therefore, the condition is a times root pi over two plus one, p is equal to zero, or uh, a is equal to uh, minus uh, over root pi, right? Two over root pi. I'm going to bring this onto this side. I get a root pi over 2 is equal to minus 1, or divide by 2 over root pi. Yeah. All right, so the solution then is f of eta is equal to the b, which is 1, minus a, which is 2 root pi, 2 over root pi, the integral from 0 to eta, e to the minus eta squared d eta. All right, this is my solution. And it satisfies all the boundary conditions. Where eta, where, well, where eta is this thing. All right, so what does this, uh, this function look like? Um, this is a known function. It's called the error function, this, this bit here. So the, the solution is really the following. f of eta is equal to 1 minus error function of eta, where the error function is this. r of eta is equal to 2 over root pi 0 to eta e to the minus eta squared d eta. So it's a tabulated function called the error function. Um, and what does it look like? Uh, all right, what does it look like? Let's uh, make a movie of the solution uh, of the profile of the velocity as a function of time. And um, we're setting up the parameters. We're faking a current to be 10 centimeters per second, capital U. Nu is 1 times 10 to the minus 3 meters squared per second. And we're going to plot uh, the velocity profile from the surface down to 1,000 meters. And we're going to plot it at uh, time steps every day for 10 years. So and this is just labeling the axis, making sure it looks pretty. The way we code it up is that inline function u is equal to at of tz nu and u in terms of the earth and making sure to put the plus sign. Uh, let's fix that. All right, here it goes. So that's the velocity profile. And you could see that the speed at a fixed depth increases until it reaches uh, capital U, right? So it's uh, slowly approaching and it keeps, the, um, the speed keeps deepening. So there's no, um, the velocity profile is not trapped close to the surface. And so I wanna emphasize that, that eventually the momentum diffuses and keeps diffusing downwards so until the whole water column will be moving at the same speed U, if you're willing to wait long enough. We can also plot um, the velocity at a fixed depth um, as a function of time. So that's what the figure two is going to plot. We're plotting uh, u at 200 meters depth. And we're normalizing it by the capital U. So at 200 meters, there's the tidal. So you can see um, on the right panel, 
is the velocity is a function of time. So even after 4,000 4, days, the speed is still increasing um, for that particular diffusivity. If I make the diffusivity uh, bigger, then it'll diffuse faster. And I'm going to plot it at steps of every 10 days for 100 years. And now you'll see it'll reach 1, right? Eventually, the speed increases until the full water column is approaching a speed of 1. Uh, the x-axis keeps getting reset here. Hold on. I'm going to set the axis from 0 to 1 and from uh, minus 1,000 meters up to 0. All right, so now with a fixed axis, it won't keep rescaling. Now I'm going to do it for 20 years. I'll go back. All right, here we go. One more time. Let's try it at 500 meters this time. All right, and you can see that the speed increases forever. Well, until it reaches you, but at every depth, it'll keep uh, increasing, even down to a thousand meters. Right, the speed increase eventually, even at a thousand meters, the momentum that's put in by the stress of the surface will diffuse downwards all the way down to one thousand meters.